here at Sun and Fun, day three, looking at yet another creation from this gentleman in the bright blue shirt. I'm Dan Johnson, talking to Robert Beardsley, Bosley, and uh, Jim Bearden. I think I've got that right now after three tries. So every year, this has become a routine for us. We show up here because there's something we haven't seen before. I don't know where you keep pulling these things out of your hat, but what do we got in front of us this time, Robert? This is a full-scale sop with camel uh, with a welded 4130 fuselage, and this is our 30th year with a different airplane every single visit. Is that right? Fun. 30 years in a row, every time a different airplane. Correct. That's, I don't know if that's a record or not, but as far as I'm concerned, that's got to be a record of some kind. Pretty amazing. Sop with camel is what a lot of people know. Why do we all think we know that name? Well, it was obviously made famous by Snoopy and the Red Baron. It was the Snoopy's famous aircraft. So it's because of cartoons that we know reality. I think so, yeah. <laughs> Where do you come up with all this, the detail? Well, again, like we always do, just contact the local, you know, like Smithsonian oftentimes will give pictures or, or uh, drawings and things. Uh, there's, of course, there's a lot of documentation on the Sopwith Camel, a lot of three-view drawings out there that have been available for many years. We just take those uh, standard three-view drawings and from there we can determine the cord, the span, and things like that. Once we know what the uh, cord is, we take our airfoil, plug it, that airfoil in, that determines our spar location. Once we get our spar location, that determines the truss location for the rest of the design. It's for the fuselage and cabane. So we basically start with the overall size, determine the airfoil, the airfoil drives back whatever the rest of the structure. Now when you're looking at these 3D views though, you're, you're not looking at CAD cam drawings and stuff like that. I mean, no, you're looking at, at stuff out of books and whatnot, Correct. right? Just a three, three, dimen three view uh, wireframe drawing. And 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 from that, are you able to pull dimension information right off of it, or do you have to go well? If that's that long, then this must be that long. We do a lot of scaling on things, you know, and that's literally what we do is take blow, blow it up as large as we can, take a pair of dial calipers and, and determine all the hard points, that, like again, the span, the cord, the percentages of things, and there's a lot of things you just have to interpret. What would it have been? You know, where was where was this located? And, and that, that's how we do it. Now, that sounds like, okay, that would be impressive enough if it just came out here and sat and looked good. Mm -hmm. But that's not where it ends. You go fly these things. No, we go fly the airplanes. They're flyable, just like all of our other designs. They're flyable airplanes. We just we use that as a starting point. And then we apply our technology, our background, you know, engineering background, mechanical, uh, A and B background to build it. We worry about weight and balance. That you know, pilot's position. We weigh the engine. We know what it weighs. We generally know what the tail is going to weigh. The history has given us all that over the years, and, and we just plug all that stuff in the formula. And determine where we think we're going to be and then you have to go build the airplane to find a weight on it and see where you're at. We're usually pretty close. We're within 15 or 20 pounds of estimated weight of the airplane and uh, the reality is when we get right to the end before we actually build the engine mount we'll weigh the airplane with the pilot in it do a real accurate uh, weight and balance calculation and when we weld the engine mount then we'll move it a half inch forward or back is that right? to do the okay. final balance with and that, the, that's how we get you're there. You're getting your weight with the pilot in it though. Yes, well, the pilot's already <laughs> in that way we were 100% accurate with the weight and balance at that point. Now in this what Robert has been doing all these 30 years so obviously you're getting it down pretty good after 30 years. Very good I would say. But there's a little bit of a leap of faith there right to go okay he seems to know what he's doing he seems knowledgeable but it's going to be me and the airplane at some point. Does it give you any concern, Jim? No. Uh, what I did, uh, I actually stumbled upon his website when I was looking for a biplane back in uh, 2017. And uh, once I saw his website and found out where he was located, and I live in St. Charles, Missouri. He's in Holden, Missouri. I actually drove over How two times you? and saw his operation and saw what he was capable of doing and talked to some other people that had aircraft before I decided to go ahead and do this. So it wasn't just a snap decision. I, I took some time to think about it. But you did what people should do. Good for you. So eventually now, you're going to take this airplane and you're not just going to display it either. You're going to go have some fun with it? Oh, yes. I already have flown the airplane and intend to continue to fly the airplane, but uh, hopefully get to take it for display as well. While it looks as authentic as it can be, surely you're not using the same actual materials that they did back when this airplane was being produced, right? That's correct. Yeah, we use all modern materials. Basically, when we designed the airplane, we're using a, a 4130 structure fuselage versus what would have been wood. The original wings were also wood, uh, and they're now aluminum structured wings. So, so we're using all fairly modern materials. They're certainly 
especially compared to the year it was built as modern materials. Uh, but we're dressing it up to look like the old airplane so that we got modern reliability. Uh, this airplane you ought to be able to fly hundreds and hundreds of hours of minimal amount of maintenance. And the reality is there are very few original types of airplanes left because they were wood and, oh. and, and, and fabric. They basically decayed into nothing. So that's one of the specialties we do is we'll recreate something using modern materials so the guy can go ahead and fly them, operate them, and be safe with them. And be able to keep it for a while. Be able to keep it a long time. Yeah, this airplane will be around a long time. All right, so you've heard now the description. You went and checked things out. You got a pretty good idea what's going on. Tell me a little bit about the build effort using modern materials to get to this old look. Okay, uh, so to be completely honest about this, I told Robert right from the start, I said, Robert, I'm a pilot. I am not a mechanic. I am glad to help you in any way I can in building this aircraft, but you have all the technical expertise. So Robert was right there, step by step in, in the building process. I could never have done this by myself. I would never attempt to do this by myself. You know, some people have that knack. I don't. So I, that's why Robert was a great assist in building the aircraft. Well, fortunately, FAA has been for some years now, and in fact, it's going to advance a lot further. They like the idea of professional builder assist, and that's what you did then. You went with, uh, did you, you did drilling and I cutting did drilling, and riveting, all the and pieces, putting, right? putting fabric on the wings, painting, and all that other stuff, but it, he was right there with me to make sure, okay, yeah, that's right, okay, you can do that. <laughs> all so. that 30 years of experience uh, <laughs> watching over your shoulder made that's, it a lot easier, right? That's correct. Correct. Well, basically there to coach and keep him going the right direction, oversee what he was doing, and just, just give you the confidence to continue on with the project. So, so how many hours did you invest in this project? Oh, Lord. Uh, approximately. Uh, we don't need an exact probably number. Probably 600 hours probably between us. Okay, combined. well, that's not that bad, though. Yeah, with the actual building process started uh, late summer of 2017, and then the aircraft was finished the end of August 2018. Tell me a little bit about how it flies. Uh, very nice, very comfortable to fly this airplane. Um, I was a Navy pilot, flew uh, attack aircraft, okay. so I was used to going high and fast, low and fast, and then I was an airline pilot, so I was used to going high and fast, so I wanted to go low and slow, so that's what this airplane does. Uh, cruises at about 80 miles per hour when it's going about as fast as it's going to go, and of course, all the world is right there for you to see because you're not in an enclosed cockpit, that's so right. it's just, you're there with the winds and everything else, so it's very enjoyable. I, I really enjoy flying the airplane, and it's an easy airplane to fly. When I'm taking off, the airplane basically leaps into the air at about 40 miles per hour. You weren't used to that in your airliner, right? I wasn't used right? to that at all <laughs> in any airplane, so that, that was something to get used to. And it'll stall somewhere, you know, around 30 to 40 miles per hour is where it's gonna, the stall speed's going to be. So I'm looking over your shoulder here, Robert, and I'm seeing what appears to be the engine. Am I looking at the actual engine, you or are. is that part of mark mock-up and there's a modern engine behind it? Well, you're actually seeing the cylinders. This is a Lycoming you know, 320, so it's okay. a modern engine. Uh, just hidden in the black cowling, you know, we just, uh, but we've got modern reliability with this. You know, the old rotary engines first were not reliable, and uh, there's a, a lot of the, the problems with the original camel flying bad qualities was the fact that the engine spun and rotated. People don't, a lot of people don't realize the engine actually rotated, and it caused gyroscopic issues. Well, this just solves all that. It's reliable, and just go fly the airplane. Yes, I would say most people, me included, for until I was educated properly, think that a rotary engine is always fixed. No, uh, in position, not. and it is not. The cylinders actually spin around on some of those engines. That's correct. Basically, they bolted the propeller to the crankshaft and the and the crankshaft to the firewall, so the entire engine spun with the propeller. That, it's a kind of a fantastic thing. All that inertia and weight yeah. and everything whirling around in front of a pilot and not being reliable on top of on it. On top of that, correct. That's yep. got to get your attention, I'm thinking. So. It's, on the other side of the airplane as we approach, there's some guns sitting out there, or what looked like guns. Correct. Tell yep. me a little bit about that The part. Camel was famous because it was the Camel. It had twin Vicker machine guns on the top, and they actually formed the sheet metal over the guns to keep them warm. And that was some of the jam gun jamming issues in World War I. The guns would get cold, the oh. receivers would get cold, and they would fire hot rounds. Well, the thermal differences would cause cause jams, so they figured by covering it up, it would keep some heat inside the guns, and it, it solved a lot of the jamming issues in World War One. So, therefore, this airplane got named the Camel because it had a hump over the guns. Ah, that's where the name came yeah. from. I did not know that, yep. so further education for me. Um, 
but you know I look at where the prop arc is and I look at where the guns fire so tell me how that worked back in the old days they had a synchronizer gear basically on the back of the engine and they would time the propeller they knew when the propeller would be in the arc so therefore the gun would not shoot at that time frame uh, so the reality is you pulled the trigger and held it on you pulled against a spring and the interrupter came around and said not now not now but it lets you hold it on any time in between so you were pulling against a spring that was doing the ultimate work and the and the cam stopped it from firing when the propeller was was scheduled to be in the arc okay well that's all great information I wish you well with it and all your display of it I'm sure people will be excited to see it as we are every year when you bring another one out I don't know what's coming next year but I'm confident there'll be something there'll be something where do we find out more about aerodrome airplanes Robert where do we uh, send them on the web just visit our website or our Facebook page just at aerodromeaeroplanes.com or on Facebook aerodrome aeroplanes as well so uh, go on there we do weekly updates uh, what we're working on the shop so you can follow the progress of a new aircraft being built if you want to and uh, like I said, just, just join it and follow and see what we do. All right, sounds good. Find out more about these kind of airplanes from Aerodrome Airplanes and lots of other aircraft in the affordable aircraft range. Thanks for joining Robert, Jim, and myself here at Sun and Fun.